Hello and welcome to Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thanks for joining us. I'm Malcolm Borthwick, Managing Editor at Bailey Gifford. When you think of Japan, conglomerates such as Sony, Hitachi and Mitsubishi, which have powered Japan's export growth for a generation, come to mind. You probably don't think of Shimoseki, a manufacturer of automated knitting machines, Dassault, which owns licenses to use brands such as Lecoq Sportif and Umbro, and Showway, the maker of handmade motorcycle helmets. The equivalent of Germany's Mittelstand, these small and medium-sized businesses are the beating heart of the Japanese economy. Japan has over 3.5 million small and medium-sized businesses. They employ about 7 in 10 workers in the private sector. These are the firms that are sometimes overlooked, but not by Praveen Kumar, manager of Bailey Gifford Shin Nippon, who joins me in our Edinburgh studio. But before we start our conversation, some important information. Please remember that as with all investments, your capital is at risk and your income is not guaranteed. Praveen, it's great to have you back on Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thanks for joining us. The last time we spoke was back in episode eight, when we chatted about Japanese cosmetics. That's right. Thanks for having me again, uh, Malcolm. And you're right. Uh, the last time we had a chat was about Japanese cosmetics. And this time around, I felt it would be quite interesting to um, discuss this massive swathe of SMEs that, as you say, are the beating heart of Japan's economy and which for a number of reasons, for a very long period of time, have just been overlooked, not just by, you know, overseas investors, but funnily enough, by a lot of domestic investors as well. So there, therein lies our opportunity. So let's start with some context. How do we define SMEs and why are they significant? So there are a number of definitions. The one that we tend to use for simplicity is a company that has less than, say, 300 odd employees. If you want to speak in terms of the size by way of market capitalization, so we typically go for companies that are less than, say, one and a half billion dollars in market cap. So those would be the ones that we would kind of consider as being small or medium sized businesses in Japan. And when did we see the shift in Japan towards more of these small and medium sized businesses? It's quite interesting because Japan has had sort of two waves of innovation. The first one was obviously when Japan started industrializing well before the First World War, so in the 1800s. And then obviously after the Second World War, we had the second wave of industrialization when Japan was rebuilding as a result of the after effects of World War II. And around that time, so all through the 60s, 70s, and the 80s, a lot of that innovation, a lot of that rebuilding was led by, you know, some of the big corporates that we uh, see today. So just to give you some examples, the likes of Sony, Toshiba, Hitachi, Toyota, Honda within the automotive space. So these were all the bellwethers of the Japanese economy at the time. And they, in many cases, monopolized the um, R&D and the innovation that was happening in Japan at the time. But since then, we've seen a significant shift and you could almost consider this to be the third wave of innovation that we're seeing in Japan where a lot of Japanese companies have moved away from building these big visible products, these you know consumer electronics type products and they've identified specific niches within these larger industries where they've suddenly realized that they have some in-house expertise built over the past many decades and they've established leading global positions in these critical components across you know, many supply chains. So that is the shift that we've seen in the more recent decades and which I think is a trend that is likely to continue over the next coming decades. So that's the shift from the large companies to these SMEs. And I mentioned the middle stand. A lot of people think of Germany when it comes to small and medium-sized enterprises. There are comparisons, aren't there, between how the economies of Germany and Japan have evolved over the years. That's absolutely right. And this is something that always has fascinated me, not just from a business perspective, but even from the point of view of the makeup of the economy, some of the cultural aspects, and say, for example, you know, the savings rates, for instance, both Germany and Japan have tended to have quite high savings rates, for instance. 
and also both have uh, national champions in massive sectors like the auto sector for instance and also both had to do a bit of a significant rebuilding job of the country the economy post world war 2 so there are quite a lot of eerie parallels i would say even if you look at demographics you know they are sort of similar japan perhaps maybe a bit more on the extreme end but what really fascinates me when i look at J- germany and japan is just this entire swathe of smes obviously we you know the middle middle stand in germany we don't have a nice catchy name uh, for the japanese smes but these are you know the engine blocks or the building blocks of corporate japan and germany and the one slight difference is whilst in germany a lot of these businesses tend to be private in japan you do tend to see a lot of these smes which are often run by founders and entrepreneurs that are listed uh, which you know is good news for us because that gives us an opportunity to identify and invest in these businesses give me some examples of these companies proving Sure so one of my favorite examples is that of a company called Shoei which makes really high end premium helmets so i've got a catalog here which i can go through i mean some of the helmets look absolutely you know sci-fi futuristic yeah so very very simple product but because the helmets are virtually handcrafted and um you know there is a bit of labor intensity to the way they make their helmets these are very very high end products they have a cult like following especially amongst the hardcore biking community globally and they have uh, a rapidly growing business in china which is at a much earlier stage in terms of people embracing biking as a form of leisure for instance but the history of the company is very interesting and this is quite typical of how entrepreneurs just end up you know starting up these businesses so the founder of shoe used to work at a traditional japanese inn that was owned by his parents and two of the most regular customers at that inn one of them just so happened to be the founder of honda <laughs> and at the time obviously he hadn't yet founded honda but he was a keen biker himself so you know after a round of biking with his friend he used to come uh, to this inn and this guy apparently had a very very nice handcrafted helmet with you know some nice paintings and that caught the fancy of the founder of shoe who was you know quite young at the time and they struck a very very close relationship and then this guy the biker went on to found um, to establish honda which you know as we know is a big global company and then the founder of shoe established um, the company himself making helmets so he decided to leave his parents in and start manufacturing helmets for bikes and the friendship that they struck early on that continued through the years so much so that honda actually ended up adopting shoe as the de facto helmet manufacturer for its own bikes so really really interesting sort of um, back story to uh, shoe which is now um, you know a big well known global brand i mean looking through this magazine that you bought in these are very very high end helmets in terms of design and specificity is that typical of japanese smes that in many ways is what we see a lot of these smes do and then i'll give you an example just with helmets you would think you know a helmet is a pretty standard product you know everyone's probably owned one uh, during their lifetimes but within that what show have done is they've innovated in terms of the material that they use for the helmets I and mean, you know really robust sort of lightweight material the biggest innovation they've done is in terms of the amount of electronics that they've actually crammed into that helmet without compromising on the weight on the comfort and on the shape which is again quite important and obviously you know safety is is, is the key thing here So to give you an example one of the recent models that they've launched and there's a very nice video on YouTube of, of this model it's called Optics On O P E T I C S O N and they've developed almost like a supplementary mirror which actually shows the rider a map and you know gives the rider very useful information in terms of what's the best route to take and you know you can even receive and make calls just by voice control so there's a lot of innovation in that sense that they've managed to build into this helmet which is again quite typical of how most japanese companies tend to approach innovation it's not necessarily a big bang revolutionary new product but 
within existing products that can constantly trying to make it better refine the manufacturing techniques and trying to you know end up with a premium product in that sense and another company which i thought was fascinating is that we mentioned earlier shimiseke manufacture of automated knitting machines yes that's absolutely right and uh, again another example of a company that's you know pretty small not that well known even to a lot of investors in japan uh, um, i must say and they've uh, developed this uh, knitting machine and to be honest they've developed this quite a long time ago it's not necessarily a recent innovation but what this machine does is you take the software design of whatever garment you want to make you upload it to this machine and it produces that entire garment in just one production run so it's like you're pressing a switch and the whole garment whether it's a jumper or a pair of trousers just comes out the other wow. end the traditional way of making those would be you manufacture the different bits first and then you stitch them and that stitching process involves obviously a degree of manual labor but it also generates the most waste throughout that process because you got to make sure all the different bits are fitting correctly and then there's excess cloth and then you need to get rid of it so all of those issues are just completely taken away by this machine that Shima Seki have developed it's called a whole garment machine and when you think in terms of reducing waste impact on the climate esg etc something like this uh, with its uh, shima seki with its whole garment machine fits right in the middle of that and uh, as we know the apparel industry globally in general is among the largest producers of waste so in its own small way shima seki i think is addressing this issue and the other company that we talked about in the introduction desant i'm interested i mean a couple of european brands linked to that in terms of their distribution lecoq sportif and umbro and they have licenses for that not just in japan but some other countries in the region how do western sports brands perform in countries like japan are they popular so the western brands in japan they are popular but the overall market is still dominated by the japanese brand so if you talk about running for instance so brands like asics which is a japanese company they dominate the domestic market all the likes of nike and adidas also have a decent share but within that if you break the overall market down into specific niches you do have a lot of domestic japanese brands almost dominating those niches and desont is a classic example which in a way we always say um, across bailey gifford i suppose that we have a bias towards family run businesses towards entrepreneurs desont is probably a slightly different example in the sense that it was for a long period of time run by the founding family but they were so conservative in their business approach they didn't s- seem to understand the changing nature of the industry changing customer preferences and over a period of time that resulted in a significantly underperforming business which resulted in um, a big trading company in Japan called Itochu coming in taking a big stake in the business and they basically got rid of all the family founding family members and bought in their own professional management team and that resulted in a significant turnaround of the business but what Itochu have done apart from the management changes also focus the company's efforts on China which is a massive market so they've uh, engineered a JV between Desont and one of China's largest sporting co- goods companies called Anta Sports oh yeah and Anta Sports is now helping Desont expand its brand uh, through its considerable reach across China and helping them with advertising and marketing as well and within Shin Nippon you're very much focused on small and medium sized business when do small and medium sized businesses become too big for your portfolio so for us what is important is the starting point when we invest we specifically look for small sized businesses typically my sweet spot tends to be between the 300 to 500 million dollars or 30 to 50 billion yen range that's the range in which we would typically like to take an initial holding but for us we are looking for companies that can generate really outsized returns for shareholders and when i say outsized returns i don't mean two times or five times i'm really talking of 10x 20x over an extended period of time between 5 to 10 years now those businesses you don't find them everywhere they are very very rare businesses only a handful so 
to give ourselves the best chance of picking those types of businesses and more importantly sticking with them you know running our winners we need to be very very patient with them we need to minimize the amount of trading activity that we do just because the shares have gone up a bit you know a lot of people would probably end up thinking in terms of taking some profits etc we think slightly differently so with that sort of an investment philosophy we don't think it is an issue in terms of you know a company getting big and then what do we do with that in fact that is probably the result of a success so we are happy to run our winners for as long as we think the growth opportunity is still there once that part of the investment case starts to weaken once we start feeling that there is not much growth to be had in the future from that point onwards that would be the trigger for us to think about selling the shares it's very rarely got to do with market cap any numbers around it it's just the growth opportunity and you were in japan recently first time that you've been back to japan since the start of covid what was it like yeah so really really pleased to finally get back to japan i think it's been almost 3 years and the first thing that i struggled a bit was with jet lag obviously i've sort of <laughs> <laughs> lost a bit of practice so it took me a couple of days but it was absolutely fantastic being back in japan i was there for 2 weeks during the course of which i met around 35 to 40 companies what was striking to me was unlike what we see in the popular press here in the uk you know we get our daily dose of grim news about one thing or the other the businesses the companies that i met the vast majority of them were reasonably optimistic i would say sort of cautiously optimistic and this wasn't just a feeling that okay things are better in japan you know japan has reopened uh, to tourism they've dropped a lot of requirements but it was more rooted in just simple data and you know looking at order books looking at trends in the orders that uh, a lot of these companies were receiving and also not just looking at short term order trends but a bit further out you know say 2 3 years out so shoe uh, again going back to the example of shoe their sales and profits have been growing exceptionally rapidly shoe sales and profits have ex- absolutely exploded mainly on the back of you know europe and the us so you can imagine why they would be quite sort of encouraged and optimistic and especially when they're seeing the chinese market open up now that would really you know uh, massively boost their already significant growth profile so that was the first thing that struck me most of the businesses not really too concerned about a lot of these external events business conditions remain very favorable a lot of the companies especially the manufacturers remain brutally cost competitive and the second thing that struck me was um this is a more of a softer cultural aspect because that every single person i met was wearing a mask <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of these company meetings i was going into the first question i was asking was please can i take my mask off and in some cases uh, the, the the executives were actually quite happy that i asked that question because they took their masks off as well <laughs> and one final point if i may um there's a lot of um regulatory change across a number of sectors that we're seeing and a lot of these will be strong tailwinds for a number of companies to give you one quick example so within the real estate sector the government has now liberalized the way in which real estate transactions take place so previously there was a big element of having paper based contracts having some face to face interactions with your broker or with your agent all those have been taken away now you can basically buy and sell or lease or rent a property completely online without meeting anyone and if you want without even seeing the property which is fantastic news for some of our holdings which um, a company called GA Technologies which is Japan's leading online real estate platform and do you have a go to from uh, when you're back in Japan in between these company meetings that you you like to do from a cultural perspective yes yeah, so i th- think for investors or anyone who's going to japan my kind of advice would be to spend as little time as possible in tokyo <laughs> <laughs> because you know tokyo is not at all completely representative of what's actually happening in the real economy it's a bit like london because you know london you know it's almost a, a market unto itself you know it says nothing about what's happening in the broader uk So my advice would be to actually go and travel. So I spent a day in Osaka for instance. Although it was a short trip this time around, I usually go to a few other places, not just to meet companies, but to get a feel for, you know, what's happening in the local economy, maybe visit a few stores, chat with a few 
non investment people so things like from your uh, profession malcolm you know journalists and uh, a few academics so that's i think gives one slightly more rounded view of what's happening in the real economy rather than simply you know visiting tokyo and going to conferences which can be quite an artificial environment um absolutely essential as well for an investor in SMEs given that they're based all around Japan. But that's a great way to end the podcast Praveen. Thanks very much for joining us on short briefings on long-term thinking. No worries. Thank you very much Malcolm. Thanks for investing your time in short briefings on long-term thinking. And you can find our podcast at bedegifford.com forward slash podcasts or subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify or on TuneIn. And there are plenty of other podcasts to choose from. Praveen and I talked about Japanese cosmetics last time in episode eight when we spoke together. Or if you want to find out and explore more about the innovative Scandinavian country that has unearthed global giants such as Ericsson, Spotify and IKEA, that's also there. What's its secret? We'll find out by checking out our other podcasts. And if you're listening at home, you're listening in the car, wherever you're listening, stay well, and we look forward to bringing you more insights in our next podcast. Music